I never thought in the history of Shat we would get an email entitled Shoe Sodomy, but we are here. It's 2020. Chat on TV Lovecraft Country, the unofficial podcast companion piece to the new HBO series Lovecraft Country. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me is my co-host, Ashley Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And this is our deep dive edition where we look back on this week's episode of Lovecraft Country and provide our thoughts and analysis, plus the top listener emails for the week. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss an episode. You can do that wherever you get your podcasts or by visiting shatontv.com slash subscribe. As a reminder, we have an instant reaction live stream every Sunday night on Twitch uh, that is out now on YouTube as well, so you can catch it there. You can find that at shatontv.com slash Twitch, and we would love to see you next Sunday to discuss episode six of Lovecraft Country. And in this week's Lovecraft Live, we got lots of great audience feedback, which we'll be incorporating into this deep dive. But before we get to that, I wanted to know, Ash, what stood out to you about episode five, Strange Case? So every week we kind of get a different kind of sci-fi or horror. And clearly this episode is a body horror episode. Like it's very much like gore, body morphine, body horror. And I think it was incredibly successful. For the first time really this season, I thought the special effects didn't just work. They were nauseatingly good. And I mean that as a compliment because, I mean, it's a nauseating experience to watch Ruby transition repeatedly. But it's it's also kind of fucking awesome. Um, and so I, I thought that that was really neat. Just as a horror fan, I was a big fan of the of the gore this week that was used in a pretty poignant way. You know, we kind of mentioned last episode about how we thought they may get into the topic of passing. And we got like a real in your face, like interesting horror sci-fi twist on what passing was like during this time period uh, with Ruby, you know, changing into a literal like white bodysuit. And then, of course, the themes of metamorphosis and everything that happened with both Ruby and Montrose's storyline, I I loved. And I'll just give one quick shout out. I promise I won't fangirl out, but a a big shout out to Shangela from RuPaul's Drag Race. Hallelujah. We're super here for you. And it was great to see you on another HBO show. Everybody should go watch We're Here, which is a great reality show that she does on HBO. And it was nice to see her. But overall, I thought those things were, were good and is continuing with this kind of, you know, anthology of horror and sci fi creature of the week type experience we've gotten so far this season. Totally agree. As a big fan of John Carpenter and The Thing and that sort of horror, loved seeing the skin just slough off of Ruby's body and all of the incredible effects in this episode, which I think are far and away better than any episode we've seen of Lovecraft Country so far. For me, Ash, the thing that stood out the most in hindsight is that no one character is the star. Not only are we getting sort of an anthology look at the series through narrative, we're also getting vignettes of each person's life. Atticus, Letty, Montrose, Ruby, all are getting quality screen time and examination. And yes, there are other shows on HBO like Westworld that that focus on several different characters. But I think Westworld, if you boil it down, it's still about Dolores, right? Like it's Dolores' story and everything that kind of goes around that. Game of Thrones, it's it's about Jon Snow. Breaking Bad clearly is about Walter White. I really can't say that this show is about Atticus. I mean, he's in it, but we're not particularly meant to see it from his perspective or to celebrate him as some sort of hero or to see all the other characters kind of revolving around him. Everybody is getting to be the center of attention from time to time. And what I'm looking forward to is Hippolyta becoming a main character and getting to know more about her. And I hope that ultimately will happen as we go along. Now, for people who've never listened to The Deep Dive, first of all, welcome. The way we do this edition of Shad on TV is by going bucket to bucket on topics rather than scene by scene. So we're going to be talking about major ideas 
And tonight I'm particularly excited because we have the one and only Ash Schlafly here to explain literature to me, which is something that I greatly enjoy. And this episode was literature heavy. That's what you pay me the big bucks for here, Gene. Uh, gave up my university job to be shot on, uh, shot on lit with Dr. Schlafly. So it's paying the bills for sure. <laughs> That's right. And on that book tip, we're going to be talking a lot about the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but also the metamorphosis, as in Kafka's metamorphosis, and how that applies to Ruby as a character. Another topic that we're excited to talk about is legacy and trauma. Something that we saw in this episode was the way our forebears impact our own behavior and our own understanding of the world. And it is closely tied to ideas of metamorphosis and the Jekyll and Hyde duality. We'll also get into some excellent letters that we had from listeners. And of course, the ever-present voicemail from Flavor Dave. There's a lot to cover, so stick around for all of it. But I want to start with Jekyll and Hyde. It is the obvious reference in this episode. So Strange Case, the episode title, is a nod to the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I wanted to touch on this not because people aren't familiar with Jekyll and Hyde, but because I think people don't get Jekyll and Hyde quite right. So Jekyll and Hyde was written by Robert Louis Stevenson, who, of course, much like Lovecraft, has racist elements to his work, which surprised me because Robert Louis Stevenson, when you think about it, like Treasure Island or like some of the children's poems he wrote, you wouldn't think of him as like, oh, this guy's a racist. But with all this work, as you look back, there was a very Eurocentric view of the world. And so we had some viewers like Sorsha, uh, who joined us on Lovecraft Live, saying, listen, Jekyll might even be a stand-in for Blacks, right? Being described as animalistic or barbaric. We've had other people who wrote in and said Jekyll was a stand-in for homosexuals. But regardless of the way that you look at it, there is a definite Jekyll and Hyde motif to this episode. When we think of Jekyll and Hyde, as we were taught like as kids, as we think of as a Halloween character... Dr. Jekyll is a good dude, and then Mr. Hyde is a bad dude, and there's a potion that makes this person oscillate between one and the other, right? Two distinct beings living in the same form that are transformed by a potion. But that's not really the way the story goes. If you've read Jekyll and Hyde, which is not very long, and I encourage everyone to read, Hyde isn't a simple split of Dr. Jekyll. He's actually an alter ego that allows Jekyll to indulge in all the nasty shit he couldn't do as a respectable gentleman, right? Like as a person in good standing. I think a lot of people think that Jekyll and Hyde is very similar to like Bruce Banner and the Hulk, right? Like that's that's how they picture it, that Bruce Banner is this wonderful, nice doctor who has an accident because he's such a great scientist. He's, you know, putting himself on the line for his science and it creates, you know, this monster that comes out of him. But if you are a true comic book fan, you know that Bruce Banner is as angry as the Hulk is. Like, that's the problem is Bruce Banner is angry all the fucking time. He just can't show it because society won't let him show it. And so the Hulk burst out. And the same thing is true about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, it's not meant to be that this sad tale of Dr. Jekyll, who's, you know, basically like a werewolf, right? Like he's turns into some creature that's, you know, he's unable to control. It's that it's the part of him that truly can't be controlled because it's his innate human nature that's coming out. And you have to realize that in like Victorian times, everything was all about appearances. And that's what this novella is about, is that the more you repress things, the more that you try to put up appearances in this facade of respectability, the more your true human nature is going to ooze out and seek out. And and you're going to turn into the monster that we all are, which is human beings. It's a very Hobbesian look at human nature as opposed to Locke, right? Like we're all going to starve to death because one person's going to hoard all the apples from the apple orchard, not that we're going to just plant more fucking trees, right? And I know what you're thinking there at home. What the fuck does this have to do with Lovecraft Country? Well, a lot. listener Bandicky chimed in and said, you know, people tend to think of Hyde as what we consider a monster nowadays. Big, slobbering teeth, the whole works. But Hyde isn't that. Hyde is just about the monstrous behavior of humans. Hyde is just a guy who trampled a child. Like that's what he is as a character. And we see that behavior in various manifestations in the characters of this episode. So 
a lot of people said, okay, yes, we get it. Ruby, she's drinking the potion. It's a Jekyll and Hyde thing, right? But it's not just Ruby, guys. Let's look at Atticus, for example, right? So Atticus wears the artifacts of respectability, right? Like he's a soldier. He's a veteran. He's a good dude. He's young. He's forthright. We think of him as a hero in this series. But that uniform, the dog tags, the glasses, they're all there as artifacts of respectability. I mean, he flat out says to Letty after he pummels his father, he says, please don't be afraid of me. He's voicing his request to the whole world. Please don't be afraid of me. He is a large, muscle-bound black man capable of violence, and he just wants to be understood as a human being. Please don't be afraid of me. And in this episode, we get a look back at what he's been hiding. Yeah, there is that violence inside him that we saw in this episode. I didn't feel satisfied in the least watching him beat the shit out of a guy who beat him up as a child and killed an innocent in Yahima. But the bigger thing here that Atticus is hiding isn't his violence. It's his past. It's what happened in Korea. And that's clearly something that haunts him, which made me think of military service itself as a Jekyll and Hyde, right? There's a dichotomy there. What you do over there is considered necessary. It's expected. It's part of the job, but it's unacceptable here. But you're not a different person. It's the same human being, whether it's over there or over here. And I think that's what Atticus is representing in this episode. I think it's interesting when I was reading your notes, when I read this part, because I think about like my own father. So my dad was, um, I mean, he was a Vietnam War hero. Like he's got two silver stars, one with a V for valor. He's got two purple hearts. Like he, I mean, he was a true war hero. He saved multiple guys' lives when their plane was shot down. But he's the kindest person you'll ever meet. But like the shit he did over there was dark. And one day we were at uh, tennis courts. Uh, we were going to play racquetball inside. And there was this group of Vietnamese young people standing there and they were playing tennis while we were waiting to get into the racquetball building. And they were speaking in Vietnamese because this part of New Orleans is a very large Vietnamese population. And my dad had to leave because he had this overwhelming like need to like protect me from them and physically harm these guys who were doing nothing just from hearing them speak Vietnamese. Like it had nothing to do, my dad's not racist. It has nothing to do with their race. It was that it triggered something in him from when he was overseas in the war. And we've had multiple conversations about that interaction because I've never seen my dad like so fuming with anger. And it's very much like a Mr. Hyde moment where it's like he is forced to become something else because of a situation that's put upon him that's not acceptable here where he can be Dr. Jekyll all the time, but that it's always inside of him and encouraged to be inside of him in order to be a successful soldier when that enemy is cast and said that this is the bad guy and you need to react. You know, your Mr. Hyde needs to come out to react in this way against them. And I think I think you're really on to something there. And to clarify, this Jekyll and Hyde thing isn't about having fun, right? So in Jekyll and Hyde, the classic tale, right? It was a way to kind of get his kicks while still being a respectable person that eventually overtook his life and, you know, essentially led to <laughs> spoiler alert. But we see here in this episode that Lovecraft Country also does something quite sensitive and quite sophisticated in examining Montrose in this Jekyll and Hyde split. And this is an interesting one because Montrose is almost a reverse. His everyday persona is monstrous. This is a guy who's always angry. His very presence on screen at any given time, it feels violent. He could just be doing nothing at all, but as a viewer, you're like, shit, what's he going to do? You know, he, he looks like danger. And his hide side on the flip side is the expression of affection. And this made me think about homosexuality in a totally different way. The world around a gay man will allow any man to be violent and angry and cruel. That's expected behavior from a guy. It's it's okay to do. We're taught that anger isn't even getting emotional. It's just responding to things, right? But that same world that allows you to be violent and angry and cruel will crush you for loving in an unapproved way, which is the most ridiculous thing I can think of. Love should always be accepted and anger and cruelty 
and violence should be rebuked uh, when it's undeserved. And in this case, we see that Montrose is taught through his entire life that that violent side of him is okay, but the other side he has to mask. And to me, that is monstrous as hell. Well, and to go back to the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, you, you talked about how Bandicoot brought up the point that Hyde wasn't meant to be a literal monster, like to look like a literal monster. And actually in the novella, he's described as being slightly smaller than Dr. Jekyll himself, because it's meant to be that he it's the smallest piece of his personality, that it's the lesser piece. And I think that's true of Montrose here, because I think the cruelty in him is the lesser piece of his personality. And we see that in this episode that so often anger is coated with fear anger comes, like the root emotion is not anger. The root emotion is fear. And there's so much for Montrose to be afraid of. And this is another level of otherness for him, that he's also a, you know, a queer individual that is hated. If he were white, he would be hated for that. And so to be black and gay in this show is another layer of violence and another layer of repression and another layer of othering. And he reacts in this violent way way because of the way that the world treats him. We see here him revert back into his Dr. Jekyll self, right? Rather than him go into his hide. And I thought that that was actually a pretty cool twist to the other character storylines that we see here. And this Jekyll and Hyde phenomenon is echoed through several characters in this episode. Uh, The store manager, he's entrusted with the professional development of these people who work at Marshall Fields and the civility of his store, right? He should be the pinnacle of appropriate behavior. But take him to the South Side with a black woman, and suddenly, you know, he's a rapist. It's not that he was transformed by going, you know, to another part of Chicago. This was inside him. The police, they're expected to protect and serve, and they do that for Hillary. They're calling her ma'am. They're trying to protect her. And yet they menace the black community. Christina uses her white femininity as a weapon, but is also, in a Jekyll and Hyde way, able to enjoy that violent freedom and power of being William. But the most significant character with this Jekyll and Hyde dichotomy is, of course, the obvious example of Ruby. She is the focus of this episode and the reason why it's called Strange Case. And so we're going to transition or have our own metamorphosis into the next Ooh. section. Hmm, to the next section of this podcast that we're going to call the metamorphosis of Ruby. And upon rewatch, I had an opportunity to go back and, and rewatch this this evening. There is one line that didn't stick out to me the first time that I kind of listened to on this second watch because I was so just kind of taken aback because it's in the scene where William is taking her out of her skin suit for the first time, right? But on the TV, there is a television program that's playing and the voiceover is talking about this phenomenon of the Kenyan locust and the way that their metamorphosis happens and that it happens in five phases. And the last is when they become sexually mature. And I quote, they devour everything in their path. And little did we know upon first watch that the showrunners are setting us up for the five different stages of metamorphosis that Ruby's going to go through in this episode. So we're going to kind of take you through all five and we're going to use them as a way to kind of digest some of the, the bigger themes that we picked up on in this episode. And just as a reminder, guys, we try to keep these to an hour. In this episode especially, we could spend four or five. Like We could have a true seminar class with you guys about this episode. So if there's something we didn't cover, it isn't necessarily that we we missed it or it isn't that we didn't think it was important. It's that there was so much. This is what we've chosen to focus on. And this is cue to you to say, if we don't cover what you want, please write into us at host at shotontv.com. Give us a call at 914 719 chat and let us know the parts that were important to you because Lovecraft Live on Sundays and our Shappy Hour is where this conversation continues. So, with that huge prefacing, let's talk about metamorphosis number one. So, obviously, this is the most painful of the different stages of metamorphosis physically that Ruby goes through. And it also is the one that I think is incredibly tragic because it appears to us to happen without her consent. 
So last we saw, she's having super hot staircase sex with demon tatted William. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there they are. She wakes up and she's in this new form. She's in this white body. Now, this is incredibly Kafka-esque. And we're going to get to that in a moment, I promise. So put a pin in that. But Ruby is in this new form. She doesn't recognize it. And rightfully so, she's freaked the fuck out by the fact that she has changed. Um, She then goes out. She experiences a little bit of the kindness in the world that white women are able to receive due to their privilege. And then she comes home and in an incredibly painful way has to have this chrysalis, this form physically destroyed in order to unearth this newly formed Ruby, what she's become after this first stage of metamorphosis. And now she does have to have some help with William. It was very Dexter, you know, with the plastic sheeting everywhere with the big knife. But he takes her out of this form, and we have now completed stage one of our metamorphosis process. Yeah, Ash, this house must go through an ungodly amount of plastic (laughs) sheeting. Because if you molt this often it, it's basically like going to the restroom right like could you imagine a house where people don't quite make it to the bathroom like on the regular there's just shit and piss but on a serious note ruby says of this experience that it wasn't pain it was being unmade and i think that speaks exactly to what you're saying that this first step of the metamorphosis was the most painful because she had to let herself go to move on when well, william says to her stop fighting it You just need to stop fighting it. And so she does in the second phase of her metamorphosis. She stops fighting it and decides to consent to what's going on. Ruby chooses to don this white suit and she goes out in public in her Hillary shell and she enjoys life in a way that she's not been able to do so before as a black woman. She's treated to an ice cream cone, an ice cream shop. She can do whatever she wants to do. And what she chooses to do is to sit on a bench, read the newspaper and not be harassed by anybody to just enjoy the world around her. And in the second phase, if the first is all about pain and being unmade, the second is about finding peace and another shell that's something other than what she was before. And if eating ice cream and reading a newspaper on a bench feels pedestrian to you, that's intentional. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to do normal, everyday shit without being interrupted. And that piece that you're talking about, Ash, is simply a lack of interruption. And Ruby says in this episode, most days I'm happy to be both, meaning black and a woman, But the world keeps interrupting. And that got me thinking about the fact that we always talk about the struggle of being black or the struggle of being a woman, how much of a burden that is for a person. It's fucking not. Being black is not a burden. Being a woman is not a burden. It's the interruptions that are the trouble. Those things on their own in a vacuum, in a perfect world, are beautiful, wonderful things to be celebrated. The trouble is people interrupting those experiences. Absolutely. And Ruby kind of does some interrupting of her own in this third phase. So if the first is pain and the second is enjoying the peace that can come with being something else, let's talk about how the third is about beginning to wield power, that she's beginning to feel her own power. And so what Ruby does is she goes and she gets this dream job that she has at Marshall Fields. And I have to tell you that speech that she gives in her job interview about why she loved Marshall Fields so much because her mom needed needed it to feel loved and welcome. It's one of the best like job application speeches I like ever heard. It was absolutely fantastic. I would have given Hillary the job as well. So YouTube, where we got some hate this week because I said that uh Tamara got the job because she was beautiful and thin in a conventional way, right? People were like, well, no, that's not true. She got it because she was there first. We get the confirmation in this third scene of metamorphosis that she did get the job because the boss liked the way that she looked, right? I mean, she's not qualified. She has like no education. She has no nothing. And this is echoing from the book. We knew this already from the book that the reason why Ruby thought maybe she wouldn't be hired is because of the fact that she does 
doesn't like meet some white conventional standard of beauty. And Tamara, while she has dark skin, she's very thin. She doesn't have curves like Ruby does. You know, she is conventionally beautiful. And let's clarify that Ruby had applied for the job before Tamara. Tamara did it, quote, on a whim. That's why Ruby's so pissed off. It's because she's like, wait, I applied. I didn't get the job. I figured it was because I was black. Turns out if you're black and thin and conventionally attractive, then maybe you still have an in. Right. Absolutely. And so then she goes and she gets pissed and she takes out this aggression on Tamara. And there's this whole dressing room scene where they're talking about her. She confronts Tamara and Ruby begins to kind of feel herself in this this white suit. She feels the power that can come with it. But Ruby still can't help but kind of be coming through because the metamorphosis isn't complete yet. The little bits of Ruby that exist are there. She's still got this amazing attitude. She's got her bluntness. She can't hide her rhythm when she's dancing in this scene with these women, even though she's wearing these tiny stilettos that the white women are forcing on her. She still is able to, to keep a bit of her former, you know, self. And that kind of gives us a bit of a foreshadowing into what the next metamorphosis is going to be. And note the way that Ruby as Hillary scolds Tamara. It's the same verbiage that she's using in those debates with Letty and others in her community. It's that bootstrap sort of prodding to do better for your race. So she's taking an opinion that she has that doesn't necessarily gain traction. And then she's going to a position of power and expressing that opinion again to another person of color in order to see if, if it sticks. I appreciate the way they played with how Ruby navigated that line between blackness and whiteness and what she would do as a character that was sympathetic to another person of color and what she would do as a person who was given power over a person of color. You know, she kind of forces Tamara to take all of them out to the South Side. It's, it's a way of her even wielding more power over her, more influence over her, and kind of forcing her to do this without her consent. And what happens in that bar scene is what brings about the fourth metamorphosis, which is my favorite of the five, because she sees this genuine appropriation going on of Black culture. It's these tourists that are there and enjoying the black world is like some like way to make themselves cool. It's like a commodity for them to consume. And she watches them dancing. These white women dancing with black men are forcing Tamara to teach them how to do certain, you know, certain dances and and stealing their music and things that we're seeing would, you know, it's like the beginnings of what has continued to happen today with like the hip hop culture and, and everything that we argue about today with cultural appropriation. You know, Ruby is watching this and we're seeing the precursor to what continues into 2020. And so Ruby's had enough. She goes outside. She says, fuck it. She crushes that red vial and she chooses to take off her Hillary suit herself. And what I love about this transformation is we actually finally get to see her body emerging in this one. So previously we see her eyes and there's those great moments where like her eyeballs in the throat and then like the thing falls down her face. Like, you know, we see the grossness of it, but in this it's centered on her hips and on her, like her breast and everything burst out her woman her curves, her body, literally herself comes crashing out. And it isn't painful for the first time because she's accepted it and she's allowing it to happen. And then the camera pans up and we see her face. She's fucking Ruby. She's confident. She's pissed. And we know in this moment, she has become something other than she was at the start of this episode. Ash, this scene really hit home for me because I absolutely detest, I don't know if it's even a thing, but I'm going to call it social tourism, right? It's when people from the mainstream go to goth clubs to, quote unquote, see the freaks. Mm -hmm. It's when you go to the drag bar because they're weird and fun. It's, It's inviting yourself to the barbecue, right? And I've been told time and time again by my peers, by my friends, by my family members that there's nothing wrong with it. But here's the problem I have. People should be free to go where they want to go. But what that opinion doesn't consider is that some of us, 
built communities because we were judged elsewhere, because we didn't belong, because we weren't allowed. And now you come into our community and it's a gag. It's funny to you. It's amusement. And you have literally the rest of the world to enjoy. It's like if the mainstream person, the the person in power, in this case, the white middle class north side Chicagoan, you have all the toys but you got to fuck with that one doll I've got, that one fucked up shitty doll that's my only source of joy. You got to come in and destroy it. And that's what I felt Ruby was going through. Like you said, it triggered that powerful and most enjoyable part of this metamorphosis. Before anybody, I think, emails us and and talks about, because I think this is a big trigger point for a lot of people, especially a lot of white people. They don't understand why it's wrong. And I think they, when people don't understand their own privilege, I talked about how fear is the basis of anger. I think they're afraid of what that means. Like they're afraid of being told they can't consume something because they consume everything. And so then they get angry about it. And I think the thing you have to understand here is it's not just about in partaking because I'm a huge fan of hip hop. Like there's, there's tons of hip hop that I love, but it's a matter of understanding where the culture comes from. It's educating yourself in terms of why it's not yours (laughs) and how it came to be. So, you know, we have a ball scene in this. It's like people who walk around today because now there's drag con where the RuPaul's drag race and, and drag stars are like rock stars and they should be because they're fucking fierce. But, you know, people walking around saying things like Sachet, Shantae because RuPaul says it, but they've never fucking watched Paris is burning and they know nothing about ball culture and they don't realize where it all comes from. That's the problem. It's not about just wearing a shirt that says not today, Satan right? It's about understanding why that that saying got said and, and where it is. And that's what Ruby's watching here. The the one woman asks for Tamara to teach her. I forget the dance she calls it, but she doesn't ask about it. She doesn't ask about where it comes from or why it's being taught or if she even has a right to know it, right? And that's what kind of triggers Ruby's aggression and brings us to the fifth metamorphosis. So in the beginning, just as a reminder, they said that stage five would be sexual maturity and they'll devour everything in their path. Well, here, Ruby clearly has reached full maturity and she's ready to devour what's in her path, which for her is her boss. That she's witnessed trying to sexually assault Tamara. He calls her a horrible racial and misogynistic slur and she's going to get her revenge against him. Uh, She sexually assaults him with a stiletto. It's clearly a way that's meant to humiliate him. Ruby is something other than she was because I think the Ruby at the beginning wouldn't do something like this. She has become this new thing and she leaves the remnants of her cocoon all over this man, like literally leaves the remnants. And her metamorphosis now is complete and we don't know what that means moving forward. For Ruby, but it certainly means something. Ash, in episode four, the audience was divided over the killing of Yahima. I feel in episode five, this is the scene that divided the audience and, and us, frankly, right? It was, mm-hmm. how do we feel about Ruby essentially sodomizing the manager with a stiletto? And personally, I was invigorated and enthused by this scene. I felt Ruby unleashing her rage using the stiletto, this object that was thrust upon her by other white people kind of as a gag was fitting. And the reason why is that Ruby knew that there was no way she could report what happened, what she witnessed to the police, right? What are police going to do if she says, yes, I witnessed this man, this respectable Marshall Field store manager, sexually assaulting a black woman on the South side? They're going to do nothing. So she did something she knew the manager could never report to the police, right? How is he going to explain this to cops that this woman shed her skin. I thought she was white. No, she was a black woman. She forced me to submit to bondage uh, and then sodomized me with a stiletto while her panties were in my mouth. Like He's never telling anybody about that. And it's that unspoken, unreportable crime, I think, that she was trying to achieve. But I know that others who watched this saw it differently. 
Yeah, I mean, I talked on Lovecraft Live about how icky, let's use that word, icky, this scene <laughs> icky, made, yes. me, made me feel. And let me explain why, okay? I understand, and not to give my opinion, because this is not the place for opinions, but just to to represent the other half of that that feeling, right? Like the other half of the audience. Um, I think that, obviously, whiteness has deeply violated the Black community in horrific ways. And this show is giving us really dark and true portrayals of what that violation has looked like. But this scene is a bit different because the violation that she, the sexual assault here, right? Because that's what it is. She's sexually assaulting him because she's sodomizing him. Um, There's two issues with it. One It's a bit cheeky with Cardi B's Bodak Yellow playing, you know, making literal bloody shoes. If you're going to do something like this, perhaps doing something cheeky along with it that cheapens the whole thing. And it makes you confused as an audience member. Is this a gag? Is this supposed to be lighthearted? Or is it dark? Which one is it? Because maybe if they were choosing to be that dark and they were choosing to make us uncomfortable, maybe I could buy that. But it feels off to have a cheeky lyric in the background that you can't help because you know it's coming. These are red bottoms. These are bloody shoes. Like you, like you, that's like the line everybody says. And so that's the first issue. And the second is in an episode that is so beautiful in its portrayal of acceptance of homosexuality and acceptance of a queer community to have something that in systematically in media of all forms has been used as a way of forced, you know, forced sodomy to be a way to just depict homophobia and to drive home a tradition of the fact that the worst thing that can happen to a straight man is to be sodomized because they are so homophobic and our society has been so homophobic. To use that as a means of violation, again, I think it's very confusing. (laughs) I think that you've got this beautiful rebirth of Montrose and then you're hurting his community with this scene. The same way I felt last week, you got this beautiful depiction of a woman of color that is trans, and then you slaughter her in the way that she would be in the world, potentially. Like, it, 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 I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's confusing and complicated and maybe a bit off in terms of what the intentionality is. And I hope that doesn't get a string of hate mail. But with all that in mind, if we haven't talked about enough dark stuff, guys, sit down, gather together, and let's dive into Kafka. Um, Yes! If you know anything about me, it should not be surprising with my dark, dark, tainted soul that Kafka speaks to me and that he's one of my favorite authors. And this episode is clearly inspired by his most famous work, which is The Metamorphosis, his his short story, The Metamorphosis. Um, a lot of people simply know this is the bug story, Guilty. which is fine because that's kind of what it is, including Gene. If it's something you've not read before, if you don't remember... Basically, the metamorphosis is a story of a guy by the name of Gregor Samsa, and he wakes up one day and he's been turned into what Kafka describes as a monstrous vermin. It's often depicted as a roach or a big giant beetle. Uh, Kafka wasn't very clear on that, but he's a bug, right? That's what he's transformed into. And so the whole story is about both his dealing with this metamorphosis as well as the way that his family and friends deal with the metamorphosis. And it's a beautifully tragic story that uh, I think everyone should read. But it's all about the way that his family members treat him. And, and eventually he dies, right? Spoiler alert, he dies of starvation and neglect and his family leaves and pretends like he never existed. So it's dark in that way, but it's also It has a good theme and you should read it. But the point is, is that it is a different type of metamorphosis than we're used to. Because most people, when they think of metamorphosis, they think about what my four-year-old thinks about, which is, ooh, butterflies and they're pretty. It's an ugly caterpillar and he becomes a butterfly or the ugly duckling becomes a beautiful swan. Well, no, 
in Kafka, he goes, the metamorphosis kills you. <laughs> it turns you into something dark and something that you hate and you die because of it, because everyone rejects seeing who you truly and really are. And so a lot of this episode is inspired by that. And the one thing we wanted to talk about here is if you have read The Metamorphosis and you had any teacher, perhaps other than me, um, they talk to you about how the theme in this is about how Gregor has daddy issues. And he does have daddy issues, but we don't want to get into those tonight. We want to talk about the other piece of the story, which is the sister issues that Gregor has, because there is a character in the story where his sister also goes through a metamorphosis. She initially is taking care of Gregor. She's one of the only ones that's kind to him. And eventually she becomes this beautiful person, this beautiful butterfly as he dies. And it's a dichotomy that we think maybe is an underlying message, a bit of foreshadowing for what's going to come in this story. Because if you read any Kafka, there's always one character that is the opposite of the other. There's one that is fully arrested in their development as another kind of blossoms into something else. And in the story, it's Gregor and his sister. And in this show, we also have a pair of sisters. We have Ruby in this episode who is going through a very violent metamorphosis, both figuratively and literally. And then you've got Letty. She is kind of arrested in her development in this episode. She's in the bathtub and she's talking about, I don't really know what I believe. I don't know what I want to become. She is stalled out and she is looking at the world and she's kind of wasting away. I mean, look at her. Her skin is hollow. She looks tired. She just doesn't have the same energy and magnetism that she had in the first few episodes while Ruby, her energy and her life force is growing. And that very much is what happens in the metamorphosis. And so we just wanted to bring it up. A lot of people have been asking us to go a bit deeper into our literary and I guess we're missing our brain boners. I get it. I've had a dry spell too. And so we wanted to just put that out there that maybe that's a theme that we're looking at here between the two of them that one is going to be growing in strength while the other one is going to maybe start wasting away a bit. This is not an accident, guys. Jekyll and Hyde and the metamorphosis are intentional literary references that give us a roadmap for how to navigate this episode. When speaking of insects, the last thing we want to talk about in this section is to go back to those locusts that we started with. There's another mention of those African locusts again, which is in Montrose's lover, the owner of the bar. He is a, you know, by night drag queen, and he is clearly performing at a ball and ball culture in, you know, the 1950s there in Chicago. And he is performing what he identifies as an African locust dance, an African locust performance. Performance. So that is linking back to the beginning. It's clearly a callback to what's happening to Ruby as well. And Montrose clearly has his own transformation here. But I think the more tragic piece of Montrose's transformation is that unlike Ruby, he still has to keep his transformation under wraps. He has this beautiful moment where he exposes himself and who he is and who he's been afraid to be by kissing his lover on the dance floor where he denied kissing him after having sex with him previously, that acceptance, that freedom through movement, the acceptance because of that movement is so beautiful, but it doesn't really matter because when he walks out of that ball, he still has mantras and he still has to pretend like none of that exists and that that awakening, it has to be put to sleep in him again because it is completely at odds with what he's allowed to be outside of those rooms. Several listeners and I loved that feeling of acceptance and beauty of diversity in this scene. It was powerful. It was moving. It was gorgeously shot, right? In an episode where we had so many ugly things, it was wonderful to have this one sparkling, glitter-filled, red-lit moment of beauty and triumph uh, for Montrose. But Montrose also in this episode is a figure of trauma. And that brings us to our topic of legacy. So when we covered Watchmen for Shat on TV, we were schooled in the impact of legacy and trauma, even the topic of genetic memory, right? Where if a horror is 
brought upon a people generation after generation that will actually carry on to their offspring and to future generations. Well, Lovecraft Country goes after this idea of legacy and trauma, but it tackles it in a totally different way. So after episode four, I said the voices that Montrose is hearing or recalling while he's listening to this radio broadcast about the Cold War, about nuclear proliferation, was evidence that Montrose was violent toward Tick, that he was an abusive father. And I thought that was helpful. I almost thought it was hand-holding by the show. Instead, we had a differing opinion from listener Sorsha E, who says, it was clear to me that Montrose was remembering what his father was saying to him as he was, quote, beating the feminine, end quote, out of him as a child. Remember, George saying Montrose was so loving and creative as a child and was artistic, Montrose was able to embrace that aspect of himself again tonight, referencing episode five. And this is something that I didn't catch, but it lends so much richness to the show. This idea that Montrose had this beautiful part of him beaten out, this Jekyll of him beaten out and had to be the hide as a result of his upbringing, as a result of the legacy that was handed to him. And speaking of that legacy, Letty and Atticus later in the bathtub scene, I would call it, Ash, you weren't impressed with their romance in this episode. I thought it was quite touching. Uh, but the two of them are discussing their experiences with love and how their parents informed those experiences. And Atticus, again, referring to Montrose, his apparently gay father, says that he never had love modeled and therefore he isn't sure he's ever had it, which to me is a big red flag, by the way. If, if, if you've got a guy who says, I don't know what love looks like, but I think I love you now, <laughs> run the fuck away. Letty says that her mother was always in love, just every day was in love with another person. So she was waiting for something lasting. And we see here that as a twist on what Watchmen taught us about legacy and trauma, here we're seeing a different aspect of it. How does your legacy, how does your upbringing affect the way you love, not just the way that you hate? And to add an additional fold, an additional dimension to this discussion, I love that they brought in the fact that Ruby grew up alongside Letty and they processed the same upbringing differently. Now, this is the show showing its smarts. You've got two characters, as you said, Ash, they're parallels. How many ways can we use this parallelism to explain the ideas that we're trying to bring across. And here I thought that was really fantastic in the idea that Ruby and Letty are completely different people, but both of their development is a logical extension of their mother and the way she raised them. And that brings us to our letters and voicemail for this week. So the first one comes from one of my favorite contributors to Shad on TV, one of our good friends from Westworld, John Lish. And John writes in and says... Hey, y'all. Had the opportunity to watch Lovecraft Country Episode 5 this morning, then listen to your Twitch instant reaction. There's a couple of things rattling around my head. First, and this was a small moment in the episode when Tick and Letty were talking as Letty was taking a bath, how Letty described Ruby felt wrong. We have been given a character in Ruby who is hardworking and hardheaded. I don't think we have seen the woman that Letty describes who constantly falls in love. This made me think back in earlier scenes when Ruby describes Letty as being flighty and manipulative, which doesn't reflect the Letty we are viewing. This leads me to think that both sisters project what they didn't like about their mother onto the other. At some point in the season, this has to be addressed. Second, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of those stories that I would like to see told without the hammy hammer horror aspect to it. It is an incredibly masculine book about male middle class Victorian culture. Women literally get trampled on as inconveniences in the story. Hyde is a fiction in a similar way to how Oscar Wilde uses Bunbury and the importance of being earnest. It allows the respectable Jekyll to sate his other desires. That duality in Victorian society between what society demands of a gentleman and what goes on in the twilight. It's no accident that Stevenson has meetings occur at dusk or early dawn. 
As an historical aside, if you look at Booth's maps of Victorian cities, you see the commuting routes between the city center and the respectable middle class areas. Nice wide roads to walk along. Yet you can take a side road off the main thoroughfare and you immediately walk into gambling dens, brothels, drug dens, etc. Who was visiting these establishments? Why? It was the respectable middle class Victorian commuter. Jekyll's drug use is partly because he is burning the candle at both ends as he tries to keep his public image and his private life from collapsing and because he has become an addict. Addiction, mood swings, violence, these are all fairly predictable patterns. Is Jekyll queer? It's plausible to read him that way. The tension between keeping the appearance of the middle class doctor serving the community whilst disappearing into the shadows to pursue his base desires. This reading fits well with our story of Montrose. It would also tie in with Tick's beating of Montrose as an expression of disgust and shame as much as any frustration or anger at the death of Yahima. It makes me question whether Tick can accept Montrose living true. There's a lot to unpack for the pair of them. Looking forward to the deep dive. And would it be possible to clip any shappy hour discussion of Lovecraft Country onto YouTube as a short video? I appreciate that's more work for you. But as I am asleep when shappy hour occurs, I need all the beauty sleep I can get, frankly. It's a bit odd to stream a day or two afterwards. I do like watching the instant reaction on Twitch. That works well. Stay safe and keep well, Shat family. John Lish. Well, John, you humble and beautiful man, I will do that just for you. Uh, we will clip out from now on, and shit, I'll go back in the past too. Every Lovecraft Country segment of our Shappy Hour, uh, I will I will go ahead and clip out and put it out on YouTube as a separate uh, edition. Also, of course, the entire Lovecraft Live response you can catch on YouTube as well uh, every week. Getting to the point where you were speaking of the uh, Victorian cities and their layout, I love having an English voice here. Just explain that to me because when, <laughs> as you mention it, it makes perfect sense, right? And it aligns with the themes of this episode, right? You have what's known and what's unspoken, but also known, and both of them coexist. But it is always, always, always the Jekyll taking advantage of the hides of the world. And also, thank you so much for adding this additional dimension that I didn't think about which is Tick might not just be beating Montrose for justice, right? You killed someone who did not deserve to die. You monster, let me beat you. But this might be his rage toward his father for a series of disappointments, which might include, in fact, homosexuality, which makes Tick a much more interesting character, right? Typically, we think of our hero as being all accepting, sharing our values from 2020. Tick might be a homophobe. We just don't know. Well, I mean, look at the way he reacted last week. I definitely don't think he's thrilled about the idea for sure. But the next one we have comes from Susan from State College, another longtime contributor. Hello, Ashley, Jean, and King B. I don't know that I particularly enjoyed this episode, but it did give us some definitive answers and hooks to spin some theories from. The question of whether Christina and William are the same person is a resounding yes, but I do wonder how she transformed behind some bushes and William came out looking so dapper with all the blood, flesh, and goo gone. If Christina is to be believed, William was an actual person, not just a conjuring trick. She told Ruby that he survived after being shot, but what if he didn't? The fact that Ruby transforms into a woman we're pretty sure died when Letitia clapped her head with a shovel may mean that the magic is blood magic, fueled by the death of the target body. Could anyone who died be brought back this way? When Ruby was stuck in the closet in the captain's office, it really looked as if Lancaster had the torso of a black man. We already know that Epstein did some Frankensteinian experiments, creepy baby head on an adult body being one of them. What if there was a shootout between Lancaster and William over the leadership of the Chicago Lodge? William dies to be brought back by Christine. Lancaster has to have extraordinary measures used to keep himself alive, probably by Epstein, who perfected the technique using his black victims. Now that my daughter is also watching the show, don't worry, y'all, my kid is in her 30s. We're having some lively conversations about the episode. Thanks again, guys. Susan from State College. So. 
I have to say a lot of stuff that you say here, Susan, resonates with me. I thought the same thing about William when he comes out and he, you know, is is all dapper and beautiful and is like, please don't bother Miss Braithwaite. You know, I, I agree. And and I think it's one of two things, potentially. And I know, Jean, you hate tinfoil, but I think it's one of two things. I think it's either that William is real, like there is a William and Christina can transition into William as well. Like that was the price he paid to her is giving her the use of his avatar, which is his body skin, you know, or what you're saying here, like the blood magic. I don't know if we got confirmation that Dell in the beginning, the woman that the racist woman with the dogs in Artem, I don't know if we got confirmation she died it's 1955. You take a shovel to the head, you dead. I don't think so. I don't think we get confirmation there. I think we get confirmation she has a head injury, that she's injured. Well, we don't know she's dead. And so maybe it's also something like that. So maybe you have to get horribly injured. Maybe you have to be critically injured, but kept in some sort of, you know, suspended state. Like, we don't know. But I think there's definitely something going on here. And my question is when I hope they show... Christina topless, not because she probably has very nice breasts, but also because me too. <laughs> but also because I'm curious if she has the same mark that William has had. You know, is it there on her chest? Is that the mark of immunity that her daddy gave her? Because if so, then clearly it's always been her. It's critical to the show, guys. HBO, you got to show us Christina's chest for science. <laughs> for science, do it. The next one comes from one of our new friends on Twitch, Black Nerd. Not Blank Nerd. Sorry, Black Nerd. <laughs> and that's an inside joke. Get on Twitch, guys, if you want to know these things. Um, but Black Nerd, they write in and say, Hi, Shaq crew. I wanted to focus on the steps Ruby experiences as she settles into her new persona. But after a rewatch, I realized the true victim is Tamara. She's busy doing the work of others when Ruby notices she's not at her sales counter. As a supervisor, Ruby doesn't try to rectify the situation. She's so caught up in how an unqualified Tamara got the job she desired. Then Hillary does the unimaginable. She called a Black woman ashy. As a Black people, we literally think about how we are perceived constantly when in predominantly white spaces. Laws had to be passed so we could wear our hair in its natural state. So imagine being accused of the stereotypical dirty, unkempt black stereotype with bad hygiene. Excuse me, ashy is extremely dry skin on highly melanated skin. It gives an ashen look. It's Tamara who is alienated from the all-white staff and dealing with Paul's sexual harassment. Interestingly, the white co-workers like black culture, but not black people. They love the way Hillary danced, but probably would have shamed Tamara. A small example of the bigger issue of cultural appropriation. Racist irony is another email. Unfortunately, Tamara will face more tragedy after Paul's rape. Ruby made a point of acknowledging it was a black woman who attacked him. Without Hillary to hold accountable, I'm sure Tamara will become a scapegoat for his shame and rage. It just continues a cycle of violence. It's made me sad to think of how many more Tamaras the writers will introduce just to sacrifice them to this convoluted story. Her name will be remembered along with Yahima. Maybe the issues with the storytelling and pace are due to the number of writers. There's no clear narrative objective. Plenty of shows have demonstrated you can create complex characters with complicated ethical dilemmas and bad decision making without sacrificing good storytelling. You can embrace the queer community without the use of harmful homophobic and transphobic tropes. It does a disservice to the audience and communities they are portraying. Man, do I miss the Watchmen. Until next week, Black Nerd. Now, what makes Black Nerd's email so wonderful is adding a dimension that I hadn't considered. At the end of this episode, I cheered for the revenge that Ruby gets on the Marshall Field store manager. What I hadn't considered is what Black Nerd brings up here, which is who do you think is going to take the fallout for that, right? We see it all the time. I used to work in newspapers. And when I was on the copy desk, we would get story after story where a store would get robbed or a person would get mugged. And the police would tell us, put out a description in the article that it's a black male in his 20s with a hoodie. Well, we lived in fucking Ohio. That's 
half of the city? Are you going to enable that police harassment of an entire community because of an unreliable uh, and vague description of who committed the crime? Well, that's what we see here. Black Nerd's exactly right. What do you think the manager's going to do? He's going to look around in his own store and he's going to see, oh, there's a black woman here. Who assaulted me? A black woman. And what do you think is going to happen after that? Tamara is going to feel the full wrath of this man. I don't think the show is going to examine that, but it's a very, very responsible way, Black Nerd, to think about this episode. And I love that you wrote in about it. I, I couldn't agree more. And I have to say, you know, we've talked about pacing and we've talked about narrative issues and I think that we talked earlier about how it just gets confusing sometimes, like intentionality isn't quite so clear. I am crossing my fingers, Black Nerd, that over the next five episodes that all the pieces come together and maybe we'll just all gather back together and go, okay, well, this was for a reason, right? Like this was, this had an intention we weren't seeing and and that's possible. I'll hold out hope that it all makes sense one day. But for another perspective on the shoe sodomy. And guys, that's the actual title of this email. I never thought in the history of chat we would get an email entitled shoe sodomy, but we are here. It's 2020 and shoe sodomy. We have an email from Bridges and Bridges says, I just love you guys. I mean, I don't have to agree with you to love you and to think you do a fantabulous job. I like feeling like I am talking with friends about a show I like. So I am sorry that the first time that I ever took the time to write, it was a criticism. It was not very cool of me. And I'd like to redact most of my complaints and apologize for not being more supportive in my comments. Ash, I just want to point out something about the shoe sodomy scene. I think one of the points is what anyone will do when they have a little devil on their shoulder egging them on like Ruby had in this episode. She had the power of whiteness and then someone feeding her already judgmental character. Then throwing the attack on her coworker and violence is then justified in her mind. Eye for an eye, rape for a rape. She couldn't expose him to anyone, that would solve nothing. There is no justice that way. If she told him she saw him, he would be embarrassed, but not afraid. She had to take his power away from him. She had to make him fear. Or that is what she came to the conclusion of. That is my take anyway. I think it was difficult to watch. I thought it was powerful, and I thought it had purpose. It wasn't gratuitous. So as with the many other atrocities in this show, I am on board. Love y'all. In Christ. Bridges. I'll just say this. Bridges, first of all, thank you for writing in. Um, two things. One, your email that you sent us previously w- was not uh, harsh. Guys, we get some... Uh... <laughs> We get some fucked up shit. So like yours was yours was fine. You you were you were fine. And but we do appreciate it. We love you too. Uh, that being said, though, about your your conversation later in the email about an eye for an eye, a rape for a rape. I think I feel about this the same way I do about capital punishment. Right? Like you know, you turn the state into a murderer in order to punish a murderer. It's an irony that makes no sense to me or to my own sense of morality. And so turning someone into a rapist to make someone pay for being a rapist, it, it makes no sense to me. Um, I believe that violence begets violence. And so somewhere along the way, you have to stop that violence. And there's lots of other ways to take his power away than shoving a stiletto shoe up his ass. Um, You know, I mean, like, we could storyboard it, but like a lot. (laughs) So, And lest we end the episode on a stiletto sodomy note, we do have one voicemail uh, from Flavor Dave to lift everybody's spirits once again. Yes. Hey, Shat crew, Flavor Dave here, um, and uh, Shat family of the Shat nations of all the Shat armies out there. Very emotional episode for me. Um, I went through a lot of different feelings. Um, actually, I, I cried at one point uh, in the beginning when Kick's beating up uh, Montrose and, and uh, Letty pulls him off, and later on he says, thank you for doing that. and, and uh, that really hit home for me. I, I've been through a lot of um, abuse with my dad and stuff, and instead of instead of it being Letty in that in that situation, it was my own mother, uh, minus the sex part, of course. Eh. But it just panic that that one really got me. Um, it's really emotional for me, and, and that's the, uh, a beautiful part in the episode was when Montrose. Um, I mean, just the sex scene alone, I was like, wow, I can't believe they went there with this. Good good on them. But then when when he was in that club and he's around all that 
like positive energy, and he just he's like, "Fuck it, man, fuck it. This is who I am." I thought that was beautiful. I love that so much. And the other scene that really fucking I, I was truly disgusted by it was when uh, Ruby turns into the white lady for the first time and she's walking down the street, and that little kid walks into her, or she runs into him, vice versa. And the cops come out, or come come on the scene, and, and the whole time I had my hands up, like ready to grab my hair. It was horrible. I, I oh my god, it was it was like, I guess it was the same thing as like an Emmett Till situation, but it was just it was hard. It was hard to watch. Most of the show's been really hard to watch, but that scene, I don't know for some reason, I just I was like, it was really disgusting, and um. And then, and then all, and then all that, you know, the fun stuff. You guys nailed it the whole time. Like when the episode started, I was like, you know, they they think that uh, William and Christina are the actual the same person. And my wife goes, really? And they go, yeah. And sure as shit, no, you guys nailed it. So that was cool. And you know, I, and that's about it. I just want to say, everybody, you know, this week, um, just I don't know, try to help out each other. If you see somebody in need, give them a hand. Show some love, be kind to one another, and uh, and and everybody on the West Coast, I feel for you, especially in San Fran, Nick. Everybody else out there, it's, it's horrible, man. Be safe, and um, any anybody in the uh, New Orleans or Biloxi, Mississippi area, we got another one coming. I don't think it's going to be as bad as Laura, but this time it's definitely headed towards where my family is. So, well, at least for for now. So my thoughts, and, uh, and I'm not too much for So Flavor Dave messaged me and said he got cut off during his voicemail. As a reminder, guys, I think two minutes is like as bad as much as you get. But Flavor Dave, I would listen to you for an hour. I would listen to a Flavor Dave podcast because you are a magnificent human being. And a lot of thoughts that you expressed in there, uh, I match with. A lot of them I might contend with. But I think the point being in, you know, in all this is that this episode was very evocative. It made us feel things, whether that was revulsion, disgust, sympathy, pride, joy for the characters that we were watching. And that's really what you want from uh, TV beyond the cerebral, beyond the analysis of did it make you feel did it make you feel anything? And for this episode, I would say it was a win because I did feel things. Yeah, I, I agree. And I I thank you for bringing up the you know, the fact that the abuse resonated with you, because I think that probably resonated with a lot of people. And thanks for the shout out to New Orleans, to Biloxi and the Gulf Coast. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, it has moved away from New Orleans as of this recording and is going to hit probably Mobile, Alabama. So let's all think about the Alabamians and the very East Mississippians because they're going to get the brunt of it. So Flavor Dave reminding us about humanity and helping each other out. I I'm, I, I love it. What a, what a great way to close out the the fan part of this this episode. We did have some odds and ends for this episode, but we are running a bit long. So we encourage you to join us on Friday for Shappy Hour, where we would discuss Captain Lancaster's torso, <laughs> D-I-E, that spells die. The poem. The poem and the history of Cabrini Green. These are all topics I feel perfectly comfortable discussing while shit-faced. So that should be a fun experience. Yeah. But join us on Friday night uh, starting at 9 p.m. Eastern, and we will get to those. Yeah, and Mr. Drooly Mouth. And Mr. Closeted Mr. Drooly Mouth. You forgot him. Yeah, and Mr. Drooly Mouth. So guys, if you have any comments on anything you heard tonight um, or any of the topics that I just mentioned, be sure to join us on Friday for Shappy Hour. We'll get to all of those. How do you join us for Shappy Hour, you ask? Well, my friends, go to shatontv.com slash Twitch and check out our Twitch schedule. Then join us on Friday. It's totally free. You can do it from your web browser. You don't need to download another app to do it. We'd love to see you there. Uh, lots of the Lovecraft community have been hanging out with us on Friday nights, and we'd love to see you as well. Well, that concludes this week's episode of Shat on TV Lovecraft Country. We hope you enjoyed, and we'll join us next week for more. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram, at Shat on TV. On Facebook, just search for Shat on TV Podcasts. If you'd like to email us, the address is host at shatontv.com, or you can call us with a voicemail at 914-719-SHAT. Again, our Twitch address is shatontv.com slash twitch. Also, be sure to check out our sister podcast, Shat the Movies, 
where we join our good friend, Big D, Dick Ebert, to cover 80s and 90s movies commissioned by you, the listeners. You can find past and future episodes at shotthemovies.com. And this week, right now, you can listen to Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which was surprisingly good. It's a great episode, y'all. I know I'm biased, but it's a really fun episode. As Ash's mom calls it, the abortion movie. Where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, leave a review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-host, Ashley Schlafly, The King B, and Big D, Dick Ebert, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us on Friday night for our Shappy Hour, where we'll talk more Lovecraft Country. Thanks for listening, and wear a mask. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been forgetting to say mask. It was just the way you said, and, and wear a mask. <laughs> like <it> was, <laughs> Thanks for... <laughs> I'm sorry. And it's... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop laughing. Stop. <clears throat> <laughs> and as always, stay the fuck at home. Was that okay? Yeah, that was great. I was that. Yeah, that was you smart.